and it is moderated by Sister Kelly. And thank you. I hope you enjoy. Why don't everyone give a round of applause for Mallory? Without her leadership, we wouldn't be able to be here and do such great things. Now listen, I want you all to just sit back, relax, enjoy yourselves, because over the next hour, we're going to be talking all that jazz. <laughs> what I want to first do, I'm Sister Kelly of Inspiration 1050 AM, and friend of Fox 19, as well as the founder of Hope Fest, I'm gonna be moderating for you today. So you can put your hands together, we can really have a party in here. <laughs> but I wouldn't have anything to moderate without these wonderful people that are to my left. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna start right here and they're going to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves to, so that we all are friends, right? That we open up this environment. All right, no judgment zone. <laughs> Let's go to Miss Kay first. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for coming. All of you wonderful jazz fans. I wish we had some more uh, people that would come. Uh, I was really looking forward to today to learn what these other organizations are doing. Um, I, uh, my degrees in business, I have absolutely no musical background. Uh, I know how to organize and make money, and the musicians know how to play the music, and uh, so we're very good with each other. Uh, we founded the Cincinnati Jazz Hall of Fame nine years ago. And uh, this is the first time that we've had uh, this wonderful exhibit outside of my dining room. So uh, I thank Mallory and uh, Sister Kelly and everybody uh, who's been willing to help and have this exhibit. It's been very, very successful. And um, our next uh, um, activity is going to be our annual um, induction, which is Sunday, October the 1st at 3 o'clock at Mount St. Joe. And uh, we have four inductees. We have one special recognition. Uh, we have scholarships for the kids. We've got some great jazz to listen to. We've got a sculptor, John Leon, who's going to have his jazz uh, sculptures there in the lobby. And it should be a very interesting afternoon, so please join us there. Um, you can uh, go to our website to get tickets, or you can just show up and uh, have a nice afternoon. And now I'm going to pass this along to my friend here on the left, Mr. Nate Henderson, who is a host on uh, WMKV Radio. He's also one of our hosts. We're getting our own radio program, which is going to be, instead of all that jazz, it's going to be all that Cincinnati jazz. And uh, so he's working on uh, that with several other hosts. So please make welcome my friend, Nate Henderson. Thank you, okay. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Kay on a few projects and also had the pleasure of working with someone very special here and I'll let her introduce herself. But we were a part of Jazz Alive and when I was a part of Jazz Alive, it's a nonprofit that promotes jazz in the greater Cincinnati area. I had the pleasure of hosting concerts at senior facilities and quite an experience. Uh, I have a cane, I don't know if you saw it or not, but uh, one of my experiences was when the people would come in, uh, they'd be on a cane kind of like I am. And we'd play the music and after we started the music, they put the cane on the side, and one of them came up to me and says, Nate said, play that music. He said, I just want to shake a tail feather. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a part of it. Uh, WMKV FM, Maple Knoll Village. I'm on on Sundays from four to five, and Monday nights from nine to 10. I have been a music lover all my life. I used to hang out at King Record Company when they had an 
nice house next door and they were just starting out. Um, I've been involved with different kinds of music. Sang under her streetlights, she doesn't know this, with Otis Williams and the Charms when they recorded for King Record Company, all right? And when James Brown was recording at King Record Company. But enough of that. Um, please listen, please contribute. I'm sure you will because you're here. That means something special. Uh, this is something we need to keep alive, not only for Cincinnati, but for this country. This is a culture that has been passed out and successful throughout the world. So thank you very much. My name is Laurie Gentry. I'm president of Jazz Alive. And when I sat down, it didn't dawn on me until I sat down, I've worked with every single one of these people in some capacity. Um, I was an original board member of the Cincinnati Jazz Hall of Fame and the original treasurer. Um, I've been president of Jazz Alive for, I don't know how many years. Yeah. Uh, longer than that. Wow. And Nate Henderson was our secretary and director of senior services. The lady to my left of me is my producing partner. Um, the gentleman to her left, who is also her cousin, I helped executive produce his first CD. And the gentleman next to him, uh, I, I don't, we've worked together so many times, so many different things. <laughs> <laughs> He's my liaison in being able to do educational outreach. So I've worked with everybody up here. Um, and I own my own production company, Live Productions LLC, that is um, primarily promote concert promotion and producing jazz events. I've done that for 25 years. Um, I, like I said, I don't remember how long I've been president of Jazz Live. And have promoted and presented and done a multitude of things in the greater Cincinnati area with jazz. And I am also, as of July 1st, treasurer for Jazz Education Network, which is an international organization dedicated to the promotion and preservation of jazz and jazz education. And I, wow, <laughs> sit on four other boards, yeah. <laughs> working in the arts of jazz in some capacity, um, inclusive of creating a jazz initiative for Cincinnati Nancy Sister Cities with Nancy France, which is our French sister city. Um, that's enough. So I'm going to pass this to the left. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Kathy Way. Um, I am a co-founder and CEO of Learning Door Incorporated, which is a nonprofit performing arts educational organization building resilient communities through art. I also have the pleasure of being a performer, a jazz singer, and I have been singing uh, for mm, years now. <laughs> don't say. <laughs> you don't say, I won't say. Anyway, uh, no, it's been about 40 years now. So, um, And recently have uh, won two regional Emmys for our streaming episodes for our literacy <laughs> program. Um, I've traveled to all of our sister cities as a jazz ambassador, being a part of the um, Sister City Initiative in Nancy, France. Um, and just have had the pleasure of being able to have a, a, thriving, a, a thriving career here in Cincinnati as the base. And I was just recently included as a top music influencer, and I have a kiosk at the new Cincinnati Black Music Walk of Fame downtown, which I encourage everybody to go see. It's great that we have these, these Hall of Fames Hall of Fame because it's important that we keep our legacy of music alive, not only in this city, but in this region. And that's only going to happen if you continue to support. So thanks for being here today. You could be anywhere, as somebody said recently at a concert I was at with Bruno Mars. You could be anywhere in the world. You're here with me. Yeah, Bruno Mars, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Fields. And um, as of this morning, I still play the trombone. <laughs> and I've been doing that since I was in the um, ninth grade. And I 
there's a long story associated with that, but I won't, I won't go into how I actually started playing the trombone, but it's something that um, I really like doing. I mean, I, it's, it's a daily thing. I play the trombone every day, and I, I really love it most of the time. Sometimes, not so much. It's, it's a very challenging instrument, and sometimes uh, you just have to, um, you know, get what you get. But um, I've taught a lot of uh, students the uh, art of playing the trombone from um, junior high school through. Um, you know, master students at the University of Cincinnati. And uh, teaching the trombone is such a, a great thing. It's uh, always just a great thing to be a one-on-one -on -one mentor with someone, you know, and you're, you're playing the trombone and I'm constantly sharing the wonderful things, the wonderful experiences I've had as a, as a trombonist. One of the big defining gigs that I've had is uh, six years with uh, Ray Charles and the Ray Charles Orchestra. And so the trombone just took me all over planet Earth. And um, so I, I, I write music and I organize people to get together and play music and I do other things other than play jazz. I'm a, kind of a freelance music, musician. There's actually a picture uh, somewhere floating around of me uh, in Lederhosen. That was weird, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I'm glad that you're here, and hopefully we'll, um, you know, we have a very interesting uh, exchange here as we as we uh, carry on this uh, afternoon. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to see you here. My name is uh, Dr. Izzy Rudnick. I am the Arts Curriculum Manager for Cincinnati Public Schools, and uh, in 2018, along with uh, Ellen Muse Lindeman from uh, Kennedy Heights here, we started the Cincinnati Jazz Academy. Uh, I've been involved in jazz education for, let's see, how old am I? 62, or over 40 years. Jazz music, <laughs> is American history. There's no better way to say it. In Europe, most every high school, they take a course on European, Western European classical music, because it's their music, okay? We need to have that in every single high school in the United States because this is America's music. Not only important for the music value of it, which is absolutely, you know, you can't understate that, but important from a social, cultural, economic, uh, I could go in, you know, on and on and on. None of the pop music that we hear today, none of the entertainers that we see performing today would be here today without Robert Johnson, without Bessie Smith, without Fats Waller, without Earl Hines, without Louis Armstrong, okay, without Joe King Oliver. They paved the way. And oh, by the way, they helped boost the American economy. Um, so this is such an important, um, mission for all of us up here. Uh, jazz education is how we can keep this music thriving. So just a word or two about the Jazz Academy. So uh, last year we were up to about 110 students. This year we'll probably be close to 170. We provide free jazz instruction from grades fourth all the way up to 12th. We remove every single barrier that there is to jazz education. We'll provide transportation 
from the student school. This is all done after school. Uh, we will check them out, a uh, very good quality instrument for the entire year. We will give them an after school snack. We also provide a free private lesson to them. So um, just want to let you know about this amazing program that we have that's open to Cincinnati Public School students. Thank you so much. So I'm up here with a bunch of superstars. <laughs> you all ready for these questions? Let's get rolling. I want to ask the panel. So some of these questions I will say I want to ask the panel. Some of these questions I have for specific people on the panel. That's one. Number two, when I ask the question, if we could keep it at one minute response so that if other people want to respond, we got enough time. Because I, I've been able to glean the audience as you all are talking, and they just want to hear more, right? So we want everyone to participate today and be able to talk in this discussion. Let's keep it robust, okay? Let's, let's start with this. Where did the origin of jazz begin? Anyone can answer. Where did the origin of jazz begin? I'm glad Dr. Resnick talked about the history because jazz can be traced all the way back to the tribal rhythms in Africa. And when Africans were put on, the, on slave ships, they had to figure out how to communicate different languages for each tribe. So they did that through music by the rhythm, fast rhythms indicate something happy, slow rhythms indicate something uh, sad. We get here, that rhythm changes again, words are changed to English, it becomes field songs, field songs, uh, uh, spirituals, spirituals, ragtime, ragtime, blues, blues to jazz, jazz smacks everything, as Dr. Redmond says, every piece of music in this country has been influenced by that history and that jazz, and to his point, when you're looking at the history of this country, you look at the history of jazz, you can see the framing of America every step of the way. It is vitally important we teach this as much as we can. Who else wants to respond? Um, I'll just say a quick word. Yes. Um, Kathy is absolutely right. Without the African call-in response, polyrhythms, um, rhythmic uh, complexity, we would never have this music today. And what I find just fascinating, and I keep going back to this, is that um, the timing and the environment in the South, particularly New Orleans, but not only there, um, where you had so many immigrants from all over the world with so many different cultural backgrounds. And also the fact that um, in about that time or a little later, we finally had the technology so that people around the world could actually hear this music. It swept the world, not only this country. I mean, Europe was blown away when Louis Armstrong and Sidney Bechet went over there. They just, I mean, they, they, you know, they were treated like royalty. Um, so with the African foundation and with the kind of right environment, um, you know, New Orleans and the celebration of life and music and so many different people, and also the plethora of all these band instruments that actually were left over from the Civil War. So now you have all this, you know, coming uh, together, and it really is just the most extraordinary thing in the world. All right, that was excellent. So I heard Dr. Rudnick say the word technology. Did you say that? All right, so I got a question. 
how much is AI used in jazz to enhance jazz and is it incorporated in jazz curriculum? Okay, so when I say AI, I'm talking about artificial intelligence. If you guys have been watching the news, you'll see that Hollywood is on strike because a lot of, not just our writers and producers, but our actual actors, you can take and put them, you can say, hey, um, we're gonna use this AI program and I give me someone who looks like Ryan Reynolds. We're gonna make this song Give me someone who sounds like Beyonce, and the computer can do that. And the reason I thought this would be the most interesting question for our panel is because we know that jazz is lively. Jazz is something that people do. Jazz is human, you know. But how much do you see computers coming into the world of jazz? And is it taught in curriculums? So I just gonna say before you say anything, Mark, I think we're all kind of we are all of us are jazz purists up here. So the idea of artificial intelligence, Dr. Rudnick is just like, nah, I don't even need that really. I think everybody can hear me. Um, Dr. Rudnick's like, no, nah, we're not. That's not even a consideration because. What we know for sure, technology, is there something with technology that can facilitate this genre? Yes, in some aspects. But from a per pure performance, the best way for kids to learn how to play an instrument is to get one-on-one -on -one instruction with someone else who plays the instrument. The best way for them to understand about how to get prolific on their instrument is simply practice regimen. The best way for them to understand history about the people who were really, really great on their instrument is to listen to them, listen to those recordings. Now, the medium that you have to listen to them has advanced in technology but you still have to listen to them. To get an idea about how to be a leader on the bandstand, you need to go and see a live performance and see somebody who's a good leader on the bandstand. To find out about how I can actually form a band to play the music that I compose means I have to sit down and write it myself and then write charts and give it to band members and rehearse and then find somebody that will hire me to present my band and play. That am, am, am I right? Yeah. So when he when he the reason why he's like when you say AI and he's like uh, because that doesn't filter into the process of jazz education and becoming a great jazz musician. Is there technology that helps with the overall process of the genre like? For me as a promoter and a presenter and a producer, yeah. But not with the actual learning of the genre as a musician and even the appreciation. I think that was excellent. I just see where technology has taken over so many different things that we've done. I was, I was currently with some people that were around 20-ish, and they thought it was so weird when I said when I was in college, we would write a check, and we, that was weird to them. How many of y'all know about writing checks? <laughs> that's, something, that's something we learned, right? It's, now it's something that you rarely see people do. So I brought up the AI. Let me go somewhere else, OK? We're gonna travel here real quick. I'm gonna ask Kay Casey, what was the inspiration behind 
the Cincinnati Jazz Hall of Fame. Well, I've told this story for nine years, so those of you that have heard it, I, I apologize, but uh, 10 years ago, John Von Olin came to me all excited, and I think most of you know who John was. He was a wonderful uh, drummer here in Cincinnati, played with all of the big bands, Stan Kenton, so forth. And he was so excited, he said, uh, they're inducting me into the Indianapolis Jazz Hall of Fame. That was where he was from originally, Indianapolis. Wouldn't it be nice if Cincinnati had a Jazz Hall of Fame? Hmm, I thought, well, I'm retired. I wonder what that would look like. So I called Indianapolis. I talked to the guys that have had their Hall of Fame for 35 years back then, 45 now, I guess. And we actually got together twice and talked about everything that it would take uh, to have a real Hall of Fame, Jazz Hall of Fame here in Cincinnati. And that was the spring of 2014. Well, by March of the following year, 2015, I have no musical background, so I talk to myself and I say, okay, you need to get some people who know jazz, you know, and form a board. So I went to each one of the universities and I got the jazz directors from NKU, from Xavier, from UCCCM, uh, the School for Performing Arts, uh, a bunch of other people who know jazz. Mike Harmon was our original attorney on the board. And we met, and the first meeting, the guy from NKU, a guy by the name of Brian Hogg, who's still the director of jazz studies there, said to our board, if you will do your first induction in six weeks, NKU will pay for everything. And they did. They did the ticketing, um, they did uh, a wonderful party uh, uh, beforehand for the musicians and for the few members that we had. Uh, they paid the uh, uh, musicians um, I was trying to think, the guy uh, from New York, the pianist, uh, Fred, Hirsch. Fred Hirsch came, yes, and did the concert, yes. They paid for everything, sold out 700 tickets. How many nonprofits do that in their first six weeks? Uh, Laura Gentry was our treasure, and uh, we were off and running, which was just amazing. And I keep saying, there's a bunch of those uh, guardian angels, jazz guardian angels up there because it's happened over and over again uh, for the Hall of Fame. And we started out initially just inducting into the Hall of Fame and then the next year we had a scholarship, one scholarship, and then we started going into the schools and doing free master classes. And then Cafe Lamachi uh, offered for our kids to be there every Tuesday and they have master classes there where they invite musicians to come in and, and do classes. Sue Brown was in charge, and she even got restaurants to allow our kids to go in and perform in a professional setting, which is really a confidence builder for these kids. Currently, they're every other Thursday at uh, China Gourmet in, uh, in, a, in uh, Oakley, High Park and every other uh, Wednesday at the uh, Oriental Walk in Northern Kentucky. So I think my minute is probably uh, probably two or three minutes, <laughs> a long history, but that's how it all started. Thank you so much. I have a question for Kathy and Mark. Kathy and Mark, if you would answer this question, what makes a singer or musician good as a jazz artist? The reason I want to ask that question is because we have many uh, musicians and or singers nowadays who can transcend genres. But I've rarely seen someone who is a good jazz artist transcend in that way. 
Like if you do jazz, you do, you do jazz. You may do some gospel, but you're not going to go from doing jazz to doing electronic. So I want to ask you guys, since you both are singers and musicians, what makes you a good jazz artist? Um, I would say finding your voice. You know, it's, it's, uh, somebody mentioned, I think it was, they may have been Laura, you, 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 the study, the listening, the hearing. Um, I think everybody up here, I know Mark and Laura and I were all raised by jazz enthusiasts. Um, Mark's father had a collection that was unsurpassed, unsurpassed. Um, so for me, while the world was listening to Motown, I was listening to Charlie Parker and Billie Holiday and Shirley Horn and people who ultimately I had the opportunity to present here because for me, I needed to see the legacies. So when we started a Crown Jewels of Jazz, it was a black tie sit down dinner, cocktails and a cabaret. We started with Rosemary Clooney was our first one, free of charge in Alt Park with the Blueless Big Band. And the last one we produced was at, uh, well, the last version of the dinner, we produced at Music Hall with Bertha Kitt, 79 years old, back then on point and on her tone, her voice, just amazing. That is an example of knowing, finding your voice, studying your art, and making it work for you. You have to learn to tell the story. That's what jazz is. Your music is telling stories set to music, right? So you have to learn to, to interpret, tell the story, but most importantly, finding your voice. And it doesn't really matter if you're jumping genres. I mean, I can do a blues tune in a heartbeat, put a jazz riff in the middle and sing a little bit of, you know, some pop, but that's not, you know, at the end of the day, it's your interpretation. That's the beauty of jazz. You get to be who you want to be at that moment in time in that song. Yeah, I think probably the, the best thing that I could do while I'm here in this seat is just to answer this question and probably all the other questions that, you, that you've got there just by telling you how I got to being so much in love with jazz music. Um, <laughs> you know, I've told the story, uh, I mean, I'll make it short. I told the story though, um, many times to many students and um, as time moves on the uh, the young student doesn't necessarily know so much about what I'm talking about just because you know things change so much things have changed so much since I was in the ninth grade to now but the the main the main thing about jazz music and music, just music. If it's classical music, if it's gospel music, if it's, you know, just whatever it is. If it's the real deal, if it's music, it just has to do with your love for the music. You know, how you're just drawn to the music. And and that's that's where I've always been coming from. I mean, like like yeah, you said, I, I was raised with a, uh, huge record collection. My father was a, a DJ, a jazz disc jockey. And so hearing music every day was very common. We'd sit and listen to music at breakfast time. Mm -hmm. and, oh and he would um, hear something while, while we're eating our eggs and oatmeal, he'd hear something that would excite him, and he'd jump up out of the chair and say something, you know, with the question, with the exclamation mark behind it. Oh my God! Ah! And he'd run over and he'd have to play it again. And we'd go back and sit down and eat some more oatmeal, and he would run back and then do it again. So, um, so anyway, I say that to say later on when. Um, when I got older and everybody was listening to James Brown and The Temptations and Gladys Knight, who I was listening to too. I mean, I loved them all. But I was also listening to Miles Davis and John Coltrane and J.J. Johnson, etc. And the music never sounded like something from another planet because I was just raised with it. 
And that's the biggest difference between now and then. Then, you know, like I say, you know, everybody didn't have a recollection like I was uh, exposed to, but I had, I was exposed to the music. You could actually turn on the radio. Man, this, you know, I'm listening to jazz music on the radio. It, it didn't seem like anything special. That's just how it was. You listen to music on the radio. You went to the record store and you could thumb through the records. I mean, everything about then is different than now. And so when I try to tell my students about uh, a certain player or a certain album that I that I'm really, really into them, and you gotta check out this record, it's the greatest thing. Uh, they listen to music in a different way, it's just in a different manner. It's all good, you know, but they would just uh, pull out their phone and go, oh yeah, before I get the sentence out, bam, there it is, it's playing. And that's how you're listening to music. And I listen to music, and I see, I see an album, that's one collection of, that's one work. I, 10 years later, 20, 40 years later, I think about that record, the album cover comes to my mind. I can remember when I was first listened to it, and I'm sitting down listening to it, and I'm reading the back of it, and, and, and yeah, the line is, and, and it's just all uh, such a different experience, because now you don't just turn on the radio now and just listen to jazz. Now you don't just walk into a music store and so anyway, so many things are different. Well, I did not did not mean to take this much time here, but when you talk about things like artificial intelligence, uh, you know I, I know that's a thing. That is a thing. It's it's, it's here to stay, but mm, there's nothing artificial about how I feel about jazz. I mean, when I hear something that touches me, there's, there's no other life experience like listening to something that really touches you so much. I can't even put the word artificial in the same paragraph. Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's just real. And a lot of the uh, technology it's coming, I mean, it's always, technology is here to stay, it's always gonna be here, and it's always a good thing, but it does not replace the real love and the real blessing that it is to be enriched by jazz music. So I'm going to now stop talking. <laughs> Or this could go on for a long, <laughs> long time. So, in answer to your question, in, in, in answer to your question about how you become a good jazz musician, Mark Fields just gave you the whole attitude of what of what you need to have to be able to be a good jazz musician. He just gave. He didn't answer it the way that you, you directly. But he just gave you an example of what it takes. And I will say this, Mark Fields is very, very humble because when I spoke with you on the phone and I said, she said, oh, we need somebody. I was like, Mark Fields. <laughs> I was gonna ask Cassie about who else could we ask? I said, Mark Fields, that's her cousin. She's gonna say yes <laughs> because Mark is a world-class composer. People told me that before I even actually met him personally, that he's a world-class composer. Graduated from CCM magna cum laude? No. No, but I, uh, I did all right. <laughs> I think I wrote that in your bio. You didn't use magna cum laude. Okay, all right. When there was no jazz program at CCM. Yeah. What he just gave you and everything that he said is the key to becoming a good jazz musician. All right. I got a question for everybody on the panel. So, panelists, 
please share a favorite song from another genre of music that incorporates jazz? I'd like to make a comment before I try and answer that, if I can. When you talk about AI, artificial intelligence, you're really talking about a jazz musician. Because what the jazz musicians do, and what do we hear all the time, we're gonna give you music from the American Songbook. Well, guess what? It didn't start out that way. But a jazz musician interpreted in his own way, and each musician puts his personality in that interpretation. Artificial intelligence is just learning how to do that. We do it a long time ago. So that's my comment. Um, when you say a favorite song, let me say this to you. Being a jazz DJ, I play my favorite songs, but they are songs, not a song. But what's interesting about doing that when I do a program, when I play one song, it takes me to another, all right? Something reminds me of that. And my appreciation for jazz is, I am not a musician, but I have a mental thought and attitude about music. And many jazz musicians play what I would like to have thought that I would have played, all right? So it easily becomes a part of me because it is a part of me. So not a favorite, but many, many favorites. Does anyone else have a favorite song from another genre of music that incorporates jazz? I have one. So I like gospel music. I like hip hop music, I like R&B. And back in the 90s, there was a song by a group called Diggable Planets called Cool Like That. And Cool Like That was this awesome hip hop song, but it was all jazzy. And I remember, you know, I remember being with my friends in high school, like, yeah, that's different, we're gonna play that, you know? So that's kind of what I meant. Something that was jazz based, but maybe a different genre of music. I don't know if you don't have it in your mind right now. Maybe you'll have it later. Anybody got one? Oh. Thank you, Tom Buck. The question about what you were talking about is that what you heard in Cool Like That is basically sampling from jazz. So in hip hop, um, the evolution of that genre started with sampling from jazz. And so I'll give an example. Uh, when we were, we were in France, and we were doing master classes with the kids in the schools in France, I remember we were in a middle school and I asked this young man, I mean, literally, he looked like something out of the 80s. With, uh, like, he looked like somebody from Run DMC. He had on the track suit. <laughs> And the Adidas, and he had this gold necklace around his neck, and I was like, "What's going on?" And he was like, "I said, what are you, what are you doing?" He was like, "I'm a rapper." I was like, "Oh, really? <laughs> okay." And so I said, "Who do you like?" And he started naming these rappers, and I said, "Well, let me let you listen to um, Eric B. and Rakim, Don't Sweat the Technique." And if for anybody who grew up with hip hop. This is like a, a standard, don't sweat this technique, is like a standard, you know? So the first thing you hear in that tune is a sample. Boom, 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 bass, heavy bass line. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, it's a sample that goes throughout the whole entire song. And I said, before there were beats created in hip hop, what was used was jazz samples. And you hear that, especially with a lot of quote unquote old school hip hop because that was before the creation of beats and, and even incorporated with scratching. So when you talk about what do you hear, if there's something from another genre that you hear jazz incorporated in it that you like, the first thing that came to my mind is hip hop. 
because from the origins of hip hop, that's kind of where things were moving from jazz into that genre. And so when I showed that to the kids in France, they were like, wow, <laughs> you know? And I started talking about Tribe Called Quest, Eric B and Rakim, um, um, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, Clickable Planets, all of these kind of origins of hip hop that had incorporated jazz until you transition into the yeah, beat makers. And, and that, with the evolution of people making beats, then the sampling of jazz is kind of diluted out of hip hop. Yeah, um, to be brief, the two, two um, artists came to mind when, when you talked about, you know, using one uh, genre and, and uh, sticking it in another genre. Um, like, I, I know Ramsey Lewis was somebody who I uh, really, really, really liked. And uh, got his autograph when I was in the ninth grade. And he used to do all kinds of jazz oriented gospel songs like Wade in the Water. That was big. And he, he did a lot of pop songs. Um, and everybody loved him for that. You know, he's just because jazz, jazz people kind of really uh, dug it just because the feel was always so real. You know, he just, you know, had a real feel. Again, not being artificial about it, did the string bass, acoustic piano, drums, I mean, uh, making big time, you know, hit music with the jazz trio. And, and a lot of people followed them. Also, there's a group called the, uh, the Jazz Crusaders, who I was one of my very, very favorite groups. And uh, they would do songs like uh, Eleanor Rigby. I'm gonna be playing Eleanor Rigby um, on Fountain Square this Tuesday, because I'm gonna be doing, I'm in a group that's gonna be doing the music of the Jazz Crusaders, so that's, that's on my mind now. So the Jazz Crusaders did Eleanor Rigby, they did just a lot of songs, especially once they took off the, um, the jazz part of their name and just and just called themselves the Crusaders. Then they were just that that was their ticket just to do all kinds of pop music and convert it to a, a funk and a funky jazzy kind of thing. But yeah, this a lot, a lot of people have done Les McCann would, would do that a lot where he would take gospel oriented music, turn it into jazz, or vice versa. So yeah, it's a lot of a lot of crossovers like that. All right, so does anybody remember the Ohio Valley Jazz Festival? Okay, which is now the Cincinnati Music Festival. I want to ask the panel the question, what happened to the jazz? Because the jazz was such a big part of that festival, and even the organizers have talked to me about this, about how how that festival was, all the way into now, it's kind of morphed into, there, there are still parts, but it's kind of morphed into something else. Does anybody have a comment about um, the kind of like the changing from the Ohio Valley Jazz Festival to now the Cincinnati Music Festival? Or anybody know why it may have changed? So I have a master's degree in arts administration. One of my professors was Dr. Joe Santangelo, who's a prolific jazz pianist for those of you who may not know it. His brother Dino Santangelo became friends with um, George Lee, who, who produced the um, Newport Jazz Festival, who recently passed away. And uh, just in conversation with Dr. I still call him Dr. Santangelo. Um, just in conversation with Dr. Santangelo, and, and even without a conversation, this is a call, the, the, the business model changed. It's not, the music didn't change, the 
business model changed. So Ohio Valley Jazz Festival was always at the Hamilton County uh, Fairgrounds. Now I was really lucky, and I'm sure Mark did this too, I know Laura did. Um, my parents took me because I was serious about what I was listening to, right? So I, I, I'm pretty sure I got to see uh, Nina Simone, which is an interesting story. I'll probably still be talking about it today as well, but Nina Simone, and I definitely that's where I saw Nancy go for the first time. Um, and I remember being in that um, those, with the, that wooden seat in the you know fairground. It went from there to the Crosley Field, um, and it was still jazz then. When they made the transition to the old stadium, not the current stadium, but the first Riverfront, Riverfront Stadium, that's when the change started. Because that's when the music shifted. It, it became a business model, and um, the sponsorship and the audience, changed. The sponsorship did change. Yes. Yeah. So every year it would be something. Every so many years it would change. Um, the presenting sponsor. Um, and so that has just continued. I have had the pleasure of opening the festival at least six times. And on their 50th anniversary, they asked me to come in and do a show in the middle of, because when you're opening, you're always up when the sun is shining. So you never, you're never in the light, <laughs> don't get twisted. You know, but people come, right? Uh, with their 50th anniversary, they asked me to put together a show and I brought it, I brought a, a 16 piece group to, um, to the stage in the middle of the show. Which went, it was amazing, it was a tribute to their, their history. And as they began to approach 60, I'm sure they're going to do something of that nature again, because you can't ignore it. It started that way. So I would say it's not what happened to it, business happened, just that simple. So this is the final question for the panel, and then I'm gonna turn it over, and I want to uh, allow the audience, if they have any questions, real quickly. In Cincinnati, how do you all see the future of jazz? Right here in Cincinnati, how do you all see the future of jazz? <laughs> Well, you know, for quite a while, well, okay, so like I started, let me, let me back up just a little bit. I started teaching at, at uh, the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory Music and the Jazz Department in um, uh, 19, so that's going back a little ways right there, 19, um, uh, 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 95. That's what I'm trying. Seems like I will remember that. But anyway, um, and then, uh, like, I, I, the first thing I noticed was um, the whole school was very similar to what it was when I was a, a student in terms of the the uh, the racial divide or what, you know, whatever the word is I'm looking for. You know, when I was when I went to CCM, I was one of four um, black freshmen, and it wouldn't have been us four if it wasn't for uh, James Ralph Corbett, who decided he wanted to see some black people in the uh, in the symphony. And back then, that was uh, I didn't think a whole lot of it at the time, but back then that was like pretty huge. I mean, that wasn't the, the popular hip thing to do to say, you know what, I think there should be some black people in the symphony. Now, that would be uh, kind of a, well, I don't even know if it would be a good thing now. But but anyway, I, I say that to say that so much of it was the same, including the jazz program. When I first started, there was there's always, there's always just a, a few black people in the jazz program. I was there for 26 years. There'd be some, a few years here and there where there'd be a few more of us. But for the most part, uh, kind of stayed the same. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm trying to express that point here is it did give me a good feeling about the future of jazz, going back to the, your question. It did give me a good feeling about the, the future of jazz. I mean, you, sometimes it'd be a really a good year. I mean, there's like three saxophones this year, and a, 
Yeah, good handful of people in the band. And then, of course, they graduate and go back to wherever they, they came from. You know, they come to, to CCM from all over the country. And then they, uh, they go back. And so at some point, it was, it was just like, man, you know, you're trying to put together a gig and you're looking for a bass player. And, and you know, sometimes you just think, for goodness sakes, man, you know, this is, this is black oriented music. It seems like we could, we could put together a group of people who look like me. And uh, that just became more and more difficult. And he just started looking into reasons why more black people are not interested in playing <laughs> the most wonderful music in the world. Now, I, you know, now maybe things are in the recent years, but the past just three, four, five years, there's been a handful of people who make me think we're, we're moving in a, in a better direction. You know, and I'm really glad to have been a part in certain people's lives and in terms of, you know, young black musicians. And I'm, I'm more and more hopeful. So I'm, you know, I, I, just, I just retired from CCM this past year. And I feel like I'm, I feel better about the, the future of jazz as far as, uh, especially as far as African Americans. And that's all I'm gonna talk about that for right now. I'm gonna pass this microphone over here. <laughs> so I think the key to the future of jazz in Cincinnati, it's all about exposure and education for our young people, okay? One of the reasons, one of the main reasons why we don't have as many African-American students or even a good amount of them going in to places like CCM, it goes right back to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, the barriers. Every program, every outside of school program requires regular transportation. A lot of our families and kids don't have the regular transportation. So in order to get what I call this pipeline going, first of all, you gotta start the kids when they're young, okay? They first hear this music, Claire's shaking her head up and down, yes, 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 yes. You expose these kids to this music when they're young and they eat it up, okay? Because it's music with a groove and it's music that will celebrate their individual and unique talents, right? We've got to remove the barriers. So, transportation, okay? Who's gonna provide transportation for them not saying anything bad about the CCM prep program, but who's going to give them transportation? So that's what we did here at the Jazz Academy. Boom! Private van having nothing to do with the yellow bus school system, because that's a hot mess, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, private transportation for every kid. Making sure that when we go to schools and we talk to our students of color. We really want you to be in Jazz Academy. And it's not only the African American students, we want to do a better job with our Hispanic kids here too. So you've got to remove those barriers to participation. Virtually none of our kids of color have access to you know, band instruments or have a drum set or have a base at home, okay? So they've got to be given an instrument. And what we're doing here at Kennedy Heights with the Jazz Academy is speaking to that very thing. Most of them will not go on to be professional jazz musicians. 
We know that. But they will really come to love, appreciate, and support this music. And that is the key. Okay? And as several people on this panel said, a lot of our African American kids, they don't know about this music because they haven't heard it. They're not hearing it on the radio. It's not dialed into their phones. They're not, it's not even on their radar. You start young and and you start, you know, giving them access to Duke and Ella and Count Basie. And all of a sudden, yeah, man, this has got a groove to it. Okay, okay. They start listening, listening to the music. We start bringing them to uh, performances. Uh, we do a summer program where Mark Fields is one of the teachers there. And we make darn sure that these kids can see themselves in the teachers that teach here, male and female, here at the Jazz Academy and the things that we do during the summer. And I think this, I mean, it's already starting to have a real big impact, but I think it will have a profound impact in the future. So very quickly, a um, couple of things. I believe in collaboration. So learning through art is always looking for partners. So we have a book program called Books Alive for Kids, um, where we make books come alive through sight, sound, and touch. We, due to COVID, we had to take the read the book, you make it craft, and then there's a show. We had to take the shows to a streaming platform. That streaming platform led us to producing, doing using a book called Sound of Jasmines, which is about the history of jazz. And the performance became a program that I've been doing for 40 years in the schools called A Black Anthology of Music. And we added the resilience of jazz because jazz has been resilient. It ain't going nowhere. We're gonna make sure of that. I mean, I've just spent 31 years in an organization that I co-founded with my late husband looking for ways to keep jazz alive, partnering with um, Laura Gentry once again, collaborating welcoming people to the table with you. You can't do it by yourself. You have to partner, because as a force, he's preparing kids, he's teaching kids, she's bringing a platform for them to perform. That's what we do. So it's a, it's a funnel that has to happen in order to keep it alive. But when we do Black Anthology of Music, I, I just want to say, in producing that, um, it was supposed to be a live concert. And part of that live concert featured music, ragtime music, um, and that's when I called Dr. Rudnick and said, I would love to have the Academy of Students be a part of this production. That ended up going to our streaming platform. That ended up winning a regional Emmy. Those kids have that to look at now. That's keeping it alive. That is keeping them encouraged. That is keeping them engaged. That is keeping them aware. If you tell them, they'll tell somebody else. Last thing I will say, in doing Black Anthology of Music, I now have great, great grandkids coming up to me and saying, or parents or great grandmothers, and they say to me, I saw your program at blank school, fourth grade. These are my grandkids, that's my great grandkids. I'm not old, I'm just telling you, the pipeline works. the audience, does any audience members have any questions for any of our panelists? Going once, going twice, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're related. They're, they're first cousins. Jazz and blues, first cousins. Blues, this is all, you know, my, my opinion and, and what I've come to understand over a period of time. Blues, as I'm sure you, you know, everybody knows, it's, it's really just based off of a feeling. It's a feeling. You know, when you, 
you don't have to have a college degree to listen to blues and, and feel that feeling. It's just, you know, unexplainable. It's the blues. It's the blues. Uh, and it's like the root. That's that's the word that comes to mind. It's it's the root that you, that branches off into many things. You know, and some people might say uh, R and B came from the blues. Some people might say jazz came from the blues. Once you start talking about jazz, the way I see it, and the way I've always heard it, you st it just starts in my mind getting more, for lack of a better way of putting it, more interesting. It goes into different, different directions. The blues is very often very straightforward. This is what you, this is what you came here for, and this is what it is. Boom, 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 boom. That's the blues. When you get to into jazz. That's something that uh, has evolved from the blues and it's taken many different directions. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's a big evolution. You know, there's uh, what they call Dixieland jazz, they call it uh, what, what came to be called bebop jazz, post-bop, uh, post hard-bop, avant-garde, uh, fusion. I mean, there's many different offshoots of jazz music, but it all came from the, the roots of, of blues. Once you, start, once you start talking about modal music like uh, jazz fusion and stuff that is, you combine this genre with that genre like we were talking about before, gospel and jazz, it just, it just starts to add more variety. And and, and I guess some people might even say, I mean, I don't like the way it sounds, but some people might even say it has more sophistication to it. It has more, it, you know, it has more possibilities. You know, to me, if it starts getting too far away from the roots of blues, it loses its appeal for me. You know, if it starts getting to be too intellectual and too, going off in this direction and going off in that direction. It could be interesting for me to check it out, but it doesn't stay with me. You know, um, it's, all, it's all about the blues. It's all, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. It's all about the blues. Any other questions from the audience? Yes? Well, I like something that Kathy Wade said. I went to Rosell High School with Joe Sam Angelo. And it was in the 60s, and I don't know how he could have ever gotten any better on piano. Mm -hmm. And I, I played uh, double bass, and we had a small group, a small um, jazz group. We played in the variety shows at Roosevelt High School, and Joe was always kind of the, kind of the lead guy. So to, to hear what you said about him was, was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So He's still taking lessons. Is he? Okay. Yeah, he's okay. still taking yeah. lessons. Yeah. 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 He stopped recently. He still takes lessons. But a number of us, uh, I don't really remember how, in high school, guys would here take this instrument and take this, and, and they handed me a double bass, and so I started you know, studying that and playing that. And we started talking about jazz and getting interested in jazz, and the first, I don't know, name jazz artist that I ever saw was we heard that Maynard Ferguson was going to appear at Miami University. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, we got to. So we drove up to Miami University and heard Maynard Ferguson and his orchestra, along with Carmen McRae, was the lead singer that time. Wow. And I was kind of wondering from the people on the panel, like, what was the first big thing you heard, or the first impressive thing you heard, or the band you liked, or the, the jazz artist that you liked? What, you know, what, what, do you, what do you remember about about getting kind of a start on that stuff? Just anybody, I mean, like. Sorry. 
speaking, you know, someone that knows nothing about music, what I notice about jazz that's different from the blues is jazz went in so many directions. We have gypsy jazz, but I've never heard gypsy blues. I've, it, we have Latin uh, jazz, but I've never heard of Latin blues. Blues seems to be blues, you know, American blues, but jazz seems to morph into, like you said, many other countries and many other influences. And I noticed our students always talk about they want to learn improv. They want to be able to do things differently. Every time they play a song, they want to play it differently. They want to learn those things. I'll just go back to my first remembrance of jazz. And not many people have any advantage of being my age, but uh, was in the 40s at Carthage Fairgrounds. It was J-A-T-B, Jazz at the Philharmonic, that came to town. And I still have that brochure. So that was my first introduction to jazz, and I've loved it ever since. Rick Phillips. Um, what Mark and Kathy said earlier about um, growing up exposed to jazz from our parents. Um, both of my parents were big, huge music lovers. Um, my father was the jazz head between the two of them. And um, three people that I remember that he listened to the most were um, Charles Erwin, Cannonball Adderley, and Bob James. Um, the Cannonball Adderley with Nancy Wilson, man, I heard that so much when I was growing up, it was crazy. And Charles Erwin, my parents loved to dance, so they loved what was called soul jazz with the organ. And um, I heard Charles Erland more so than any of the others, like Jimmy Smith or, um, and that was my first exposure. But as I alluded to earlier, um, I was an 80s baby. I grew up in the 80s, and so I grew up with the evolution of hip hop and gravitated to that, but you could hear a lot of jazz and hip hop. And it wasn't until I got older that I got back into listening and appreciating jazz. But my parents, when Mark was talking about, oh, you heard the music at breakfast, and then you heard it in the evening, and then um, one of the things that I always think about was my parents were birthed, quote unquote, working class, wore uniforms to work. One of the biggest things that they enjoyed doing was going out to hear music and being able to dress up. And not, because they wore uniforms every day to work, but being able to dress up and go out and hear jazz. So on Fridays and Saturday nights when they would get ready to go somewhere, you know, they would put the music on and they would get dressed and sometimes they would dance together before they would go out. And that was the thing that I remember when I started to get back into listening to jazz was that appreciation and seeing my parents enjoy it so much, not just in listening, but dancing to it. Um, I would say for my father, uh, it was all about rhythm. That's what I think I remember. The first thing about jazz is just the rhythms were so intricate. So, you know, Dave Rubin was played a lot amongst other musicians. My mother was this vocalist purist though. So Billie Holiday, Lady in Blue, the Ice Blue cover. Oh my God, yes, you had to know that. I could sing all of Porgy and Bess by the time I was probably eight. <laughs> and I would say that has probably been the greatest, the, the being exposed to the vocalist were, was a great influence for me because later in starting the whole Crown Jewels of Jazz uh, events, we started with Rosemary Clooney, but we also brought in people, I mean, this is a selfish thing on my part, I didn't really care what it was gonna cost us. <laughs> um, and find people 
We'll negotiate with you, but we had Nancy Wilson twice, uh, Cleo Lane and John Dankworth came over from London. We had Shirley Horn, and if you know anything about Shirley Horn, to see her in person, the only time I think she was in Cincinnati is when we brought her, and that was the most amazing show I have ever seen. We did do Dionne Warwick, it was her 40th anniversary, and then we ended up going to Gregory Porter when we did our jazz festival, which is when I started working with uh, Laura, Pieces of a Dream. Um, so it is what has happened as a child, and who I listened to as a child, that has truly influenced what I've learned to appreciate, produce, share with the rest of the world. So one of the things that, that I really, really like about having looked up and, and gotten, let's say, older is the fact that I um, can tell young people, I can brag about the people that I've seen, that they just read about, you know, and I said, what, Duke Hamilton, huh? Yeah, I saw him a couple of times. <laughs> well, that's, you know, I get a lot of, a lot of points for that. And so I'm talking about my, um, my first big experiences. I did see Duke Hamilton a couple of times. And, and I was like, um, maybe the first time I was maybe a, a junior or a senior in high school. And the second time I was, I was a student at UC. And I just absolutely remember it so well. And I remember, I really remember thinking right then, man, one of these days I'm gonna tell my grandkids about the time when I saw Duke Ellington. And uh, hey, that time is now. <laughs> it actually worked out. <laughs> but um, but uh, when, when I was a student at UC, there was an auditorium on campus called Wilson Auditorium. And um, they brought a lot of jazz people in. I mean, this was, this was like during a time when there was like a, a college circuit, you know, where jazz yeah. musicians yeah. Would, yeah. would just go from college to college to college. You know, they, they're booking agency, booking at colleges. So, and, and I was like at school right at that time maybe right towards the end of that era, I don't know. But Wilson Auditorium, I saw, that was one of the places where I saw the Duke, Duke Ellington in the Duke Ellington Orchestra, I saw Freddie Hubbard Quintet, I saw Ronson Roman Kirk, I saw um, Charles Laurie Quartet, uh, the Don Ellis Orchestra, I mean, and like I say, even, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't blind to the fact that this was like, an amazing time to be alive. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I knew it then, and I and um, and so now, when I talk to a student, and we're talking about a, a song that was written by whoever, and I, oh yeah, did I ever tell you about the time when whatever? And, and nobody ever gets tired of me, you know, tired of hearing that story again and again. At least they they don't look like they're tired. Of me. <laughs> But uh, so so anyway, I um, I got a chance to to hear a lot of people that um, that made um, uh, you know the, the, just incorporate so many of the just the greatest memories, and then of course later on I got a chance to play with a lot of people that I would have thought this is crazy, but. Uh, I was just thinking about um, when I, I who was um, uh, the singer who uh, <laughs> another thing about getting old is uh, <laughs> um, no, well Nancy Wilson is that's not what I was thinking about but yeah Nancy Wilson was like such a big deal. Um, well, we'll talk about it after everybody's gone, because that's what I remember, <laughs> of course. But anyway, my, um, my time as a, as a jazz musician slash, you know, studio musician 
has been just just very wonderful. I mean, I'm just so grateful of uh, of this music and the fact that I've had the privilege of uh, participating in it to, to the degree that I have. So I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. I know it's a weird, weird place to grow up, but people actually, normal families that live away from the Strip actually live there. Um, <laughs> And I started taking trombone lessons, I think in eighth grade, private trombone lessons. And my teacher uh, was the lead trombone player in one of the big bands on the strip. At that time, in the middle 70s, you could make a good living playing music in one of the big bands on the strip, because every single hotel on the strip yeah. had live music in a large big band. Yeah. Yeah. Except when Frank Sinatra came down, and then you had like a 60-piece orchestra. Right. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, towards the end of the first year of lessons with him, he, he said, hey, I can bring you down to see a show and you can just sit in the side of, of the stage and watch. And, and so I did that and it was, I, I mean, they were playing, you know, big band jazz and, uh, Part of it, they backed up a singer. I can't even remember who the singer was. It wasn't a super, super well-known uh, singer, but they did kind of a jazz, jazz set, and they played bassy, and they swung, swung like crazy, and the music just, it just came at me, and um, yeah, I, I just, I, yeah, it's just, it runs through my blood and veins and everything else. There's just, I think. Mark said a feeling that um, it's like magnetic uh, when you hear this music, and especially with all the greats, um, it just instantly captivates you. But that's kind of how I fell in love with the music. Do one thing before we finish. Each person, each person tell what's the next thing that they're doing. Because as an audience, what we're hoping is that you enjoy the conversation, hopefully you've learned something, but then you're motivated to go out and support um, what's happening in Jazz in Cincinnati to help with the future of Jazz in Cincinnati. Now just, Laura, are you reading my sheet? No. Because if people are reading my sheet, I can't <laughs> run my show. You Don't know, you say before we finish, I, I'm, I'm media, entertainment, all that. You know I'm not letting you out of here without telling them where they what's, can find you. What's going so on next? I'll start because okay. I'm singing tonight. She's singing tonight at Cafe Mabal. Oh. Right. And there's tickets still available yes. for both sets. Please, seven and nine. Sergio from um, Sergio uh, Palmies. Palmies. It'll be on piano from CCM. Um, Marie Canuvin on Maria bass. Snuva. Marie Canuvin. Canuvin. On bass. On bass. Um, and Justin Doss on the music. And then uh, Philip, Philip, Tipton on drums. Philip Tipton is on drums. Please come out. It'll be a great, great night. It's always a lot of fun. Well, like I said earlier, <clears throat> this Tuesday from 5 until 8, I'm going to be on Fountain Square with the uh, quintet, the same bass player that Kathy was going to be using, but he got sick. Yeah. Hopefully, he'll be all healed up and well <laughs> by, by Tuesday. Uh, if he's not, I'm in trouble. But anyway, that, that's Tuesday. I went to the music of the Jazz Crusaders, one of my favorite groups. Yeah. Uh, probably because I've never uh, known of a tenor, saxophone, trombone, horn section in a group when I first heard them. Later on, I discovered uh, Benny Golson and Curtis Fuller. And there are others, but that was, you know, they were just as, as um, I, I dug them just as much as I dug Miles Davis and John Coltrane, I mean, the Jazz Crusaders. So anyway, that's, that's what's happening with, uh, for me on Tuesday and then the 
following uh, Saturday, I'll be at the uh, Omni Netherland Hilton. Let's, get, let's change this name so many times. I just use all the names. Omni, Omni Netherland Hilton Hotel in the uh, Palm Court with the uh, Jordan Pollard Trio. Oh, Tuesdays five to eight. Five eight. Uh -huh. So we start the Jazz Academy rehearsals with the students. That starts on this Monday. Um, if you ever want to come by and see a rehearsal in action, um, we start at four thirty, and uh, we'll have groups this year in this room and in the media lab over there. Um, we're also going to start a jazz cabaret night and feature uh, the private instructors that teach here at the academy and a little bit later student groups. So that will be up on the Kennedy Heights Arts Center website. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone come out for that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Nate? Okay. Mr. Nate, can you tell them when you are on the air? Okay. I'd like to remind them of every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. in WMKV, and that stands for Maple Knoll Village. That's 89.3. Every Monday night from 9 till 10, you can hear jazz. One of the interesting things, many of the people and the things that they've said and the people that they have mentioned which goes back to a time that I'm sure a lot of people here don't know about. Um, I have over 500 vinyl records in my collection. I don't know how many CDs. And a lot of the people they named are people you'll hear on my program. So, you know, like I said, I go back to the 40s, all right? And I've been collecting <laughs> since then, thanks to Swallows. <laughs> And uh, then I used to, when I was very young, I used to listen to jazz out of Chicago, but I listened to it on a crystal set, which I'm sure is something very few people know anything about. And that was, crystal set was the kind of radio that you plugged in on a rock with a needle, and you got different stations. And I used to listen to jazz out of Chicago on a club review and they came on from 12 o'clock uh, to earlier in the morning. Other than WLAC, out of Gallatin, Tennessee, which played rhythm and blues from 12 to 5. So my family would think that I'm sleeping. I'd be in the bed with the cover over my head, with my earphones on, <laughs> and my crystal set. So, <laughs> but again, Sundays, 4 to 5, WMKV, and Mondays, 9 to 10. And I think you'll hear something that you like. I had asked our board, I said, how can we help the professional uh, musicians? Let's think outside the box. And one of the things they came up with was, let's do a dinner once a month, and let's go to a different venue and spotlight that venue and the musicians. The next one that we're having is September the 15th. It's going to be at a new club called Junipers. And you all heard that De Felice is closed. Well, it's across that island uh, there. I think it's, what, 6th Street? Mm -hmm. And uh, Junipers is having a Greg Chaco trio. And I don't remember the time. You'd have to uh, check with them. I'll probably be sending out an e another email. I sent it out a month ahead of time. Uh, one of the things that we have is a free email service. I have over 650 local jazz fans that get my emails. It started with six girlfriends 33 years ago, and now I've got over 650. It's free to the fans to get. It's free for the musicians to advertise. And uh, so if you want it delivered right to your uh, phone or your uh, computer, all you have to do is to send me your email. I've got my cards back on the table there. Just pick up one of my cards send in, me an email and say, Kay, put me on the jazz list. Um, I was thinking uh, also the Cincinnati Contemporary Jazz Orchestra also has a bulletin board where people will post um, 
the jazz gigs. Go out, there's lots of great restaurants, but you wanna go to the restaurants that have jazz, listen to some great music, keep this music alive. Join us, become a member at the Hall of Fame, and uh, we'll keep together, we'll be the team that keeps this music alive in Cincinnati. Thank you all. I'd like to thank everybody uh, today. I've had such a great time, and I've learned so much, and I know the audience has learned so much. We went over a little bit, okay? But don't blame my head, it was my heart. I had to let you speak, because I don't know when we're gonna do this again, but hopefully we do this again, and again, and again. Yeah. Again, I am Sister Kelly, of Inspiration 1050 AM, 103.1 FM, and Fox 19 News on Saturday mornings. You can find me there. Also, if you have events, because I'm the queen of community events, if you have events, send me your events so I can put them on Fox 19, okay? Especially things that are, you, you mentioned, like what you're doing with the kids here. That needs to be mentioned on Fox 19 because somebody's parents don't know about that, but that's something that can keep them from all these shootings that's going on. So send me your stuff, send me your stuff. I love to announce it for you, and I've loved spending this Saturday afternoon with you. Mallory, thank you. Claire, thank you. Ms. K, thank you, they, they helped work with this. And everybody on the panel, it's been a blessing meeting you all. Thank you.